Lots of energy in the room. Great start. Thank you. Um, welcome to you all. My name is Steve Andrews. I'm one of the co-founders of ASPO USA. Um, this is actually a semi-official welcome. Uh, because we'll have some more people in tomorrow morning uh, joining us. Um, just to let you know, the sneak preview is it looks like we'll have about 500 attendees, including my sister Lauren there. Um, there of those 500, uh, we have 12 countries represented, um, uh, 44 folks from overseas. Um, there's only one person from Dubai registered for the conference, and you're going to hear from him in just a few minutes. Um, uh, tomorrow morning, Debbie Cook and I will give you a little more background and, and welcome and, and uh, more remarks. And we'll be joined by Shel Alaklet from uh, ASPO International from, from Europe. We appreciate his being here. I should read a quick announcement to those of you with the in Option Investor Group you will be meeting in the Ventura room immediately after this session. Um, let's see, W.C. Fields um, on peak oil. You may not know what he said about peak oil, um, and so I'll, I'll just give you a quickie on that one. He said, if at first you don't succeed, th this follows, by the way, on the, on the media session today This kind of came to mind as we were sort of talking about how we can how our foreheads are getting flat from banging them against the wall trying to achieve some change. And W.C. Field said, if at first you don't succeed, try and try again. Then quit. No sense being a damn fool about things. <laughs> uh, to our way of thinking, I, I, we haven't followed the W.C. Field's dictum very well. This is our fourth conference. Uh, and the two parts of this conference that really make it are you folks in attendance and our great speakers, and I am appreciative to both groups very much so. Um, we're, the process evening, I'll be, I'll be introducing Peter Wells, Peter Wells in just a moment. Um, we will have, as, as the rooms get large like this one, we can't have speeches from questioners, so we ask that you get a, you'll get three by five cards. There'll be some people available, flag them down, uh, probably starting in about 20, 25 minutes, because Peter's remarks will be about 35 minutes long, 35 to 40. Uh, you'll have a chance to write down a question, and uh, we'll read some to get his, so we can focus on, on his, uh, his responses to your good questions. Um, I would like to make uh, mention, um, a missing person in action tonight. The original person who was going to speak to you this evening was Dr. Al Bartlett. Uh, he's, in case, for those of you who don't know of him, he's given somewhere around 1,600 presentations on the story of peak oil, uh, uh, little different titles over the years, wonderful presentations. We, we miss him here. He's had a health problem, but a, a, a number, a few of us uh, yesterday spent the day with him, Jim Kunstler and, and Richard Brenny and I, and uh, he is in. Uh, uh, reasonable health and, and fighting the good fight, and he sends you his regards. Um, now to our, our speaker this evening. Um, Dr. Peter Wells um, has more than 30 years' experience in the international oil industry in the Middle East, former Soviet Union, West Africa, and Europe. He brings experience and insight to developing and implementing strategies for effective business development and negotiations uh, in the Caspian Sea and the Middle East regions. He is an internationally respected and trusted figure who speaks regularly at international conferences on Iran, Iraq, uh, the Middle East, and strategic oil supply issues. Since 2005, he has been a consultant, and this is a, a key point I want to mention here, he's been a consultant to Toyota, developing a unique model of world oil, world oil supply and price forecasting. Um, a number of you in the audience may view his remarks as, as being somewhat optimistic. Maybe I'm blowing some cover here. I shouldn't be saying much more. But, um, but the key point here is that Toyota has been funding his research on peak oil. Now, back in 1996, Jim McKenzie with the World Resources Institute told me that uh, as of 1992, Toyota, peak, Toyota understood peak oil. They internalized it. And six years later, you had the Prius. Cars take a while to develop, and, and uh, uh, 
uh, Peter Wells was not the, the, the consultant at that time, but he has been uh, since then. Uh, please welcome Peter Wells. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Good. Um, I, I, I haven't spoken before an audience this large since um, an oil conference in Tehran about three or four years ago. Um, it certainly wasn't as enthusiastic in Tehran as it is here. <laughs> I hope um, you find this not too dry. It is a quite a dry subject, and uh, there's a little bit of humor on the way. I want to thank ASPO USA for inviting me here. Uh, this is the first time I've attended an ASPO conference, and it probably won't be the last. Um, it's quite an interesting atmosphere. <laughs> <laughs> I have to thank um, IHS for providing an awful amount of data to us to make this work possible, and also for allowing some of the data to be published. Um, not all of the information that I'm going to present to you can be published outside of this forum. Um, due to IHS's restrictions. I think one of the things that we, we, we have to realize is that OPEC is, and I am going to talk quite a bit about OPEC, OPEC is the major producer of crude oil as a single unit in the world and will grow in importance as time goes by. 43% of our crude oil comes from, from OPEC countries. And OPEC countries face a dilemma. They're constantly being asked to invest in new capacity, but when they did invest in new capacity in the 1980s, they were caught, caught out by the collapse in, in, in demand. So much so that they had a surplus capacity of 10 million barrels a day which they'd invested in and couldn't make any money out of because they couldn't produce it. So they have a problem as how, when and how much should they invest in spare capacity because the only place where there's spare capacity in the system is in OPEC countries, in, in crude oil specifically. And they're looking at a difference between two large numbers, world oil demand and non-OPEC supply. And they have to worry about what non-OPEC supply is going to be, and they have to worry about demand. Not surprisingly, they take a while to make a decision. And OPEC isn't a homogeneous group. It's made up of countries with different objectives, different political systems, and different approaches to, to price. And if we look at the sort of diversity diagram here, which is wealth on one axis, GDP per head, and production per head on the other, you have the relatively poor countries like Nigeria, Ecuador, Algeria, balanced against the relatively wealthy countries like Qatar with a GDP per head of $70,000, $80,000. Not surprisingly, the price hawks sit in the bottom corner of this diagram, specifically Venezuela and Iraq, and Iran. Three countries who really want to have a high price and are less keen on expanding capacity. So there are issues and constraints inside OPEC on capacity expansion. And decision making in these countries is very, very slow. On the negative side, we have this position that this oil is a national heritage. It is for the grandchildren and their grandchildren. And we shouldn't produce it all now. And that has been a persistent pattern in OPEC policy. The second thing is, when should they time the investment? When is the demand going to come through that they don't build excess spare capacity like they did in the 1980s? Thirdly, they get high prices now, they've got high revenues. Why should they expand capacity? There are political issues, some internal and some external. Key OPEC countries are affected by external internal factors like Iran, Iraq, Venezuela, Nigeria, and even Kuwait. Major OPEC producers. There's an issue of capability, an issue of openness. You know, the major oil companies say, let us have access to your resources and we'll be able to produce them more efficiently. Not necessarily true. And most of these countries are very wary of bringing back the majors that they got rid of in the 1970s. And lastly, a lot of the OPEC fields are old. And we'll talk about that in a minute. On the positive side, pulling again in capacity, is the competition in the Persian Gulf between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia, just three or four years ago, decided we are going to expand capacity. If we expand capacity, we're going to be able to dominate OPEC and control the oil market. 
Iran sees itself as a key competitor to Saudi Arabia inside OPEC and in the Persian Gulf region has followed suit. Iran is limited by sanctions, but nevertheless has expanded its production capacity from 3.8 to 4.2 million barrels a day. Most of these countries are concerned about demand destruction due to high price. So they don't want the price to go too high because then we get a lot of substitution. We get US drivers driving less, buying smaller cars. Structural demand destruction destroys their market. And for many of the countries, there's also concern about the economic system. Kuwait, Qatar, the UAE, and Saudi Arabia have $1.5 trillion invested mostly in the US. Now, they don't want to see the dollar drop too much. They don't want to see the US economy in trouble. So there's an incentive here for them to maintain a price level which doesn't hurt the US too much. Now, lastly, let's look at this. That the real big impact countries which can make a difference to capacity expansion are Iraq, Venezuela, and Iran, and Saudi Arabia. And these three of these countries are suffering from political constraints, either internal risks like Iraq, external sanctions such as Iran, internal political positions as in Venezuela. Only Saudi Arabia has expanded production capacity and has low political risk. Now, looking more at the fundamentals, just as uh, in the rest of the world, OPEC exploration success peaked in the 1960s, more than 40 years ago. The large OPEC fields, and these are the fields bigger than 2 billion barrels, started production about 40 years ago. They've been on production a long time. They were discovered a long time ago, and not much has been discovered to replace them. Now, balanced against that is a, is a policy in Middle East OPEC countries of producing oil fields at a very conservative rate. And if you take something like the Ahwaz field in Iran, peak capacity is about 1 million barrels a day. If it was Prudhoe Bay, it would have been produced at 4 million barrels a day. So they've been conservative about producing their oil fields. So we're going to see a situation unfold in slow motion in the Middle East. It's not going to happen very quickly. And we look at Prudhoe Bay, 50% production, already 9% decline rate. Pretty soon after that, it's dropping very quickly. In the Middle East, it'll be much more slow. And there'll be time to put in enhanced oil recovery, new technologies. It will just be a much slower process, a more manageable process. <coughs> so this is a and I'm going to digress a bit into how we have constructed the world liquids supply model and how that fits back into OPEC at the end. On the left-hand side, these non-OPEC components are produced more or less to capacity. On the right-hand side, OPEC production is managed to match the difference between demand and non-OPEC supply. And we have to have forecasts for each of these components in order to make sense of a world liquids model. And one of the things we mustn't forget is that crude oil makes up 86% of this supply. You know, we talk about biofuels, we talk about Canadian tar sands, but these are very, very small components today. And they're not growing that quickly. It's crude oil that matters and it's crude oil that drives the market. Now, it's not just fundamentals that matter. It's not just how much reserves and how much production. There is a relationship between economics and reserves, economics and production, and politics and production. Now, if we raise the price, we raise the marginal cost that we can produce something at, which increases reserves. Likewise, we can do exploration in more costly areas. We can increase reserves. You, know, you have to take all these things into account when you're thinking about how much production is possible. So there's an interaction between geology, money, and politics, which has always made the oil industry fascinating. It's one of the reasons I joined it. 
Spare capacity is one of the things that we've focused on a lot. Um, it has an interaction into political factors because too much spare capacity and the oil price is under pressure. And OPEC in the past has been able to contain that pressure but not completely eliminate it. So the reduction of, of uh, available money to invest in alternatives inevitably leads to a further increase in price, but not for some time. And too, too much spare capacity has this problem. Too little spare capacity and the price goes too high, you get demand destruction and OPEC countries start to think, well, we need to produce some more oil. Now, the problem with all of that is it's not instant. You can't make a decision today saying we're going to increase capacity and tomorrow it happens. Even in Saudi Arabia, if you want to turn on production, it takes three to six months to increase production because simply all the bits and parts of the system have to be changed. But for a new production, it's between five and 15 years. So if there's a market signal today saying produce more oil, develop more reserves, it's five years away before you're going to see anything. Now, most of the time, spare capacity doesn't matter to price. In fact, except for two periods of recent times, it hasn't mattered at all. It mattered in the 1980s when there was too much spare capacity. This drove the price down. The price was then set at a floor. Now, the floor wasn't at, the, at anything to do with fundamentals like what does it cost to produce. The floor was set by what Saudi Arabia needed to run the country, which is about $20 a barrel. And that was the floor that lasted for 20 years. And that was a particular market paradigm that people got used to. Market analysts, people who looked at price forecasting, economic modelers, this was the world that they lived in. This was a world where the price floor depended on Saudi Arabia's behavior, and there was plenty of spare capacity. Somewhere around 2002, spare capacity started to fall. And there were two factors involved. One was the increase in demand from Asia, particularly China. But two was a fundamental factor which is sort of buried in the data. And this was the gradual peaking of non-OPEC. Non-OPEC crude oil, non-OPEC NGLs. And that was sitting there under the data. The price went up because spare capacity had fallen. The perception was in the marketplace that there isn't enough oil to supply the market. Small disruptions started to disturb things. Price went to $147, $150 a barrel, depending on the crude type. But since the middle of this year, capacity has started to pick back up again because of Saudi Arabia's investment. It doesn't mean we're going to go back down to $30 a barrel, far from it. But we are going to enter a period when the price will fall a bit. So these are the components of future crude oil production. We're going to look at crude oil for quite a while now. We've produced about 800, 900 billion barrels. We have about a trillion barrels left, according to the IHS database. We have about 500 billion barrels in tar sands. And there are two things which we don't know, which we're going to have to make assumptions about. What is the future expiration success? And what sort of effect could an enhanced oil recovery have? So this is the future expiration success according to the USGS and according to the Cambridge Energy Research publications. We could expect another, almost another trillion barrels to be discovered, which is a lot in my opinion. Probably a lot in yours as well. Yeah, possibly ridiculous, yes. The red block here is what the USGS forecast for uh, 1995 to 2025. As you can see, in reality, we've got nowhere near that. And if we convert that red block into a future curve, you see the, the non-OPEC, OPEC, FSU piece there going forward from 2008, that's what you get. Now, is that likely? No, I don't think so. We've taken... Uh, a statistical approach, a Monte Carlo approach, a modeling approach to understand what could be in the future. Um, I point out that I'm a geologist. We have a team of 50 geologists who work the world for um, more than 25 years like me. And this is our view. Now, you could have another view. We think the, the, the mean of this is around 300 billion barrels. 
with a range between 130 and 470, which is quite a big range. It turns out that range doesn't make a lot of difference. Now I'll move on to enhanced oil recovery, something which some, some commentators make a lot about. Now this is the only mechanism by which you can increase reserves. You can do clever things in oil fields, but most of those clever things are pulling oil forward that you would not otherwise produce till much later, what we call in the oil industry an acceleration project. So you've got reserves left of 20 billion barrels. You'd like to produce that now rather than later because it makes more money. Acceleration projects. EOR actually adds reserves. And the US has the biggest experience with EOR. And there are two technologies which have actually worked. Thermal, steam injection, and CO2 or nitrogen injection, emissible gas injection. Now it turns out that these things are not universally applicable. Surprise. CO2 injection only works in relatively poor reservoirs with light oils. It's hard to see it being applied in deep water offshore. It's hard to see it being applied in the North Sea. Why? Firstly, cost, access to CO2. And secondly, most of the reservoirs in deep water Gulf of Mexico or the North Sea are very, very efficient. You get 65 to 70% recovery without anything else. With EOR, you might get another 4%. Thermal, steam injection. That's not going to be working offshore either, is it? It only works in really quite shallow reservoirs. 900 meters, maximum depth. Very good reservoir quality. You need that. You need high permeability. And you need heavy oil. Now, if you take the IHS database, 35,000 oil fields, and you filter it for, is it offshore, is it onshore, is it light oil, is it heavy oil, is it good reservoir, is it bad reservoir, etc., etc., you come down to these numbers. You have a range, EOR potential in the world somewhere between 220 and 470 billion barrels. But what's striking about this analysis is that most of the EOR potential is in OPEC. Most of it is in OPEC, which means we're not going to see it until a long time in the future. So now we put the numbers on this staircase diagram. Total conventional crude oil around 2.6. Total oil including tar sands around 3 trillion barrels. And if we just took the IHS database of oil fields and played them out, as we've done through our, through our model, you end up with a solid blocks of color here. A peak around 2012, 2013 for conventional crude oil. Now, Sarah's conventional oil, it's not quite the same definition as crude oil, is a lot, lot higher. And this gap has to be filled by assumed expiration, success, and enhanced oil recovery. It's not in the database, in other words. This is an assumption. Now, we've used a simulation model, Alex. It just makes life easier for forecasting if you try and use the same approach to the past as you have in the future. So rather than go to field by field up to the present and then suddenly jump into projects or jump into a country by country analysis, we wanted to use a field by field approach for the past as well as the future. So we built up our model from the real fields that are in our databases, including the IHS database, as well as yet to be discovered fields, which we model on the basis of how much we expect to be discovered. And this preserves the texture or granularity, if you like, the quality of the analysis into the future, almost as far as we'd like to go. This kind of conceptualizes what we do. We take the past discoveries and the future discoveries. We generate a set of fields for each. We sum them up. We use a calibration, which is based on the existing data from IHS and other sources, which really looks at two issues. What's the difference between the discovery date and the first production date? And what's the shape of the production profile? 
Now, the advantage of this approach is it gives a direct link between exploration success and enhanced oil recovery and the final production output at a field scale. We carry all the uncertainties through from the beginning of the input right the way through to the output. So we actually have an uncertainty measure which makes sense. Now, if the calibrated model simulates the past accurately, we can have confidence that it's going to do quite well in the future. And we've tested this model against USA production history, uh, non-OPEC less the USA, and the FSU. Now, what I'm going to show you here is that whole lot added up together. So this is the non-OPEC exploration success, broken down in field sizes, from 1 to 2 million barrels a day all the way up to more than 16 billion. And this is the history match from 1850 right through to 2007. It's not bad. You know, it's not perfect, but it's not bad. And that's a close-up view of the history match from 1950. Now, one of the things we found with this work is that most non-OPEC, non-former Soviet Union fields are offshore. In fact, 80% of them are offshore. And that means rapid decline rate. It also means it's very hard to apply enhanced oil recovery to them. So now we look at the exploration success part. This is just for non-OPEC. And I put the USGS forecast here on just to show you how different it is to what we think. And, I mean, it's a matter of opinion. You know, what, <laughs> which, what you like, really. Uh, and this is what we come out with on the mean case. So we've produced 625, we've got 530 to go. We are at peak in 2008 for non-OPEC crude oil. And this is the uncertainties in that forecast. As you, as you would expect, the uncertainties get bigger the further out into the future. But what's interesting is for the first 10 years, more or less, of this forecast, there isn't a lot of difference between the different model, model components. And the reason is very simple. We've already discovered what's going to be produced 10 years out, because it takes 10 years to bring something into production. So if it hasn't been discovered now, we won't see the production until nearly 2020. Now, we hear a lot of talk about above and below ground risks. And the truth is that both are present in different proportions and different components of supply. Most of non-OPEC is really uh, an above ground, uh, is a below ground problem. You know, we're running out of new production in non-OPEC countries, including the FSU, that can be brought on stream. OPEC countries, particularly Iran, Venezuela, and Iraq, it's more an above ground issue. So there's a spectrum of risk here, not, not a single answer. Now, I'm going to come back to OPEC now. I'm going to look at three or four OPEC countries in some detail. For the main OPEC producers of the Persian Gulf, this is their pattern. This is their political pattern. They are going to set a maximum, which is they're comfortable with, based on the production they can get from secondary recovery from existing fields. And anything else is going to extend that plateau. It's not going to build on top of it. This is the declared policy of Saudi Arabia, of Iran, etc., etc. So exploration success in this area, particularly in places like Saudi Arabia, is going to have an impact a long time in the future. This is Saudi Arabia, field by field, EOR, everything added in. Two things, two observations to make. I would expect Saudi Arabia to start making plans to do EOR in northern Gawa in about two or three years' time. I would expect them to start developing some of the fields they've discovered but haven't produced yet in about three to five years' time. Otherwise, they'll not be able to hold this plateau. Iran. Well, contrary to expectations, Iran has managed to increase its production capacity by 400,000 barrels a day in the last five to six years, despite losing maybe two or 300,000 barrels a day due to depletion, despite being sanctioned. It has made a number of very, very large new discoveries. 
both in gas and particularly crude oil. We would expect Iran to be able to hold a five and a half million barrel a day capa production capacity for quite some time. Iraq. Iraq is the single largest impact on production capacity. You know, five, five million barrels a day increase is quite possible in Iraq. But the question is when and how. And we think it's going to be delayed. We don't think till 2020 they'll reach their potential of seven million barrels a day. Venezuela, enormous reserves in tar sands. Much, much easier to extract the oil from Venezuelan tar sands than it is in Canada. Ambient temperatures are higher, oil gravity is higher, should be a much cheaper way of producing it. But there are problems with accessing for foreign oil companies, there are problems with Hugo Chavez's approach to this. We expect Venezuela not to be able to increase its capacity quite some time. Maybe after 2020, but not much before. So this is how OPEC looks for us on a capacity point of view, not a production point of view. We think OPEC's capacity will reach something just over 40 million barrels a day and no higher. Not the 51 or 55 or 60 that the EIA and the IEA have published in recent years. Mainly because of political decisions. And this is the EOR story from OPEC. You can see most of the EOR is after 2015 and doesn't really kick in until after 2025. So these are the challenges for OPEC. It's got to balance that capacity guesstimate. The call on OPEC is a difference between two large numbers, which are unknown. It's going to require a lot of money, a lot of expertise, which isn't always available locally. And the major potential for new capacity is in really in four countries, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, and Venezuela. Three of those countries suffer political risk. Natural gas liquids. Natural gas liquids we've looked at on a project and country basis and a gas field basis where the gas fields are very large. The recent moratorium in Qatar extension we believe is likely to be sustained, which will have a knock-on effect on Iran's capacity to produce natural gas liquids. And all those other non-crude liquids we folded in as, these are the mean values, but they have a range on them, things like oil shale, biofuels, coal to liquids, gas to liquids, Canadian tar sands. So these all have to be, have to be thought about, put into some kind of uncertainty matrix. And this is where we come up with our final view on peak liquids. Peak liquids, not peak crude oil. We're rather more optimistic than, than ASPO. 98 to 105, somewhere around 2020 as the middle, middle of the range. We've tried to test this very hard by giving it worst case scenarios, and best case scenarios. It does not make a lot of difference. We can get to 2017 or we can get to 2025. Somewhere in this range, we think, is the peak of crude oil. Demand also has an impact, but not very much. And these are the uncertainties in that model. This is just an uncorrelated uncertainty picture. If you start correlating some of the uncertainties, you get a bigger band. Now, the reason it doesn't make a lot of difference is it's very hard to make up for 40 years of declining exploration success. Because it's crude oil that sits under this driving, driving the, the production forecast, and it's particularly non-OPEC crude oil. And for 40 years, we've just had a very, very steeply declining performance. And it's just difficult to make that up. Now, I'd just like to close with two slides, one which shows the crude oil situation and why that's different to liquids. And on the, on the blue here, you see the additions to capacity in crude oil, and the green is the, is the drop in capacity as non-OPEC tails off. And somewhere around 2015, crude oil reaches a peak. Somewhere around there, we think. And that's quite a significant date, because 
Crude oil drives the oil market. The oil market trades in crude oil. It doesn't trade in natural gas liquids. It doesn't trade in biofuels. It trades in crude oil. Crude oil sets the price for all the other components. So around 2015 will be a major crisis in price. And it doesn't really matter too much. OPEC can't make up the difference after that because non-OPEC's just sliding away so quickly. And lastly, these other liquids that you know, hit the press so much, like ethanol and biofuels and Canadian tar sands, you know, to put them in perspective, yes, they're important, and they defer world liquids peak for perhaps another five years, maybe in another three years, but they, they really don't have the capacity in the way that crude oil fields have of ramping up production quickly and meeting demand quickly. They take a long time and they take a lot of investment. Yes, they will defer world liquids, but they won't prevent world liquids peaking. Thank you. That's all I have to say. Peter, what I, thank you very much for those remarks. What I will do is we'll, I'll be collecting the questions and funnel them up to you. Um, I, uh, I do want to mention that uh, uh, Peter is, has to leave in the morning. Toyota has him scheduled for two presentations in Portland tomorrow afternoon. So if you do want to, uh, if you don't get your question answered here, uh, be sure that you uh, touch base with him before he uh, uh, before he's gone. To, uh, this evening. Um, so the first question is, are the CIRA and USGS projections for the planet Earth? <laughs> I believe that's a moderator from tomorrow night giving you a, uh, a, a uh, humorous question. Um, well, they are, yes, uh, sadly. Um, uh, you know, I mean, the, the USGS approach here was, was, to, was to take a group of geologists, who experienced geologists, I mean, I'm not to denigrate them at all, experienced geologists and say, well, what do you think about this area of the world and what could be found here? And we come up with a P5 or 5% probability and a 95% probability and a 50% probability, and we add them all up in a Monte Carlo model. And we end up with the USGS view. Now, it's a bit like the number of economists. You know, if you have three economists, you have four opinions. <laughs> if you have three geologists, you have 10 opinions. Um, you know, I am a geologist. I know that these things are not very easy to, to, to capture in numbers. And uh, you can get enormously bullish about something and realize afterwards you're stupid. That's life. Uh, only the drill bit will determine that, which is why when the USGS gave these numbers in 95, we now have you know, 12 years of comparative data. We can say, well, we didn't do that. So there must be something wrong with the methodology or something wrong with the thinking. We should go back and rethink that. Now, that's not to say that USGS is wrong. It's just probably somewhere in the range they got a bit too bullish. Uh, as far as Cambridge Energy is concerned, I don't know. I mean, they'd only give one number. Uh, and they call it a resource, which isn't the same as reserves. You know, resource could be oil in place. It could be theoretical reserves. I don't know. But it's, it's 876 for Cambridge Energy, it's 900 billion for USGS. They're very close, but they're not quite apples and pears. And what we try to do is say, what's the historical performance here? How well have we done in the past? What basins are left? What do we know about those basins? Um, come to some kind of rational thinking, rather similar to the USGS, but you know, we are oil people. We've worked in the oil industry and BP and Shell and Exxon and so on. So we have a little, slightly different view to uh, 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 an academic geologist. You know, it's a different way of looking at the world. You know, we've seen the failures. You know, your first 10 exploration wells are duds. You're not a bad geologist. <laughs> it's just you know, the way life is. Um, your first one's a success. You get promoted, but it doesn't make you a great geologist. Okay, next, que next question from Shell Alaclet. Um, with ASPO International. Uh, ASPO's forecast is based on depletion. Uh, have you looked into uh, that model in detail? Um, 
we, we incorporate depletion in, in the model. I mean, when, when you have an oil, we have an oil field which has designated number of things to it, reserves, um, the time date between discovery and production, and the shape of the production profile. And those things are, are allocated to a field. And the model runs with about 30,000 fields. And each time it cycles through, the field gets a different allocation of, of uh, attributes. So the depletion of each field is taken into account through its decline curve. And we've analyzed the IHS data and all the global data on oil fields and have a database of roughly 20,000 oil field profiles which have been gone into this model through a statistical analysis. You know, you have so much of this type of profile in offshore, so much of this type of profile in onshore in this date span for this field size. So, I mean, it's broken down in quite some detail. Um, but we don't look at depletion as a totality. When we looked at depletion in, say, non-OPEC, uh, which is quite interesting, we looked at the whole of our non-OPEC forecast and averaged it. The average depletion is about 3.5%, 4%. Does your Iraq estimate uh, include the 100 billion barrels of undiscovered oil in western Iraq? Well, we don't think there's 100 billion barrels of undiscovered oil in western Iraq, um, is the short answer. Uh, we have included exploration success, but it is a long way out there. I mean, you've already got uh, 100 billion barrels unproduced fields. I mean, fields which are 20, 30 billion barrel oil fields like Majnoon, which have had about 100,000 barrels a day produced out of them. Clearly, this is a lot more scope there. There's even more scope in deeper levels because just across the border in Iran, in Darkaway, a much deeper reservoir has got you know, 3 billion barrels and a field a quarter of the size. So there's enormous scope in the existing fields and in deeper levels below the existing fields without worrying about the Western Desert. You know, I think you know, the Iraqi oil minister, um, uh, Hussein Sharistani, takes the view that we'll produce what we have, and exploration, it's nice to people doing exploration, but we're not going to produce that for a while. There's no need. We already have 100 billion barrels to produce. So if it's 100 billion barrels in the Western Desert or zero, it will not make a difference to our analysis of peak. Uh, next question. How much of the OPEC spare capacity is in sweet, light, crude versus heavy, sour? Don't know. <laughs> Don't know. Um, probably about half and half, I would guess. But I haven't. I, haven't, I can't answer that question. Um, my sister would appreciate the answer to this. Um, the terms P50, P95. Uh, why do you use P50? Um, isn't P95 the 95 percent probability case? In other words, isn't it the most likely case? Right. Um, <laughs> P5, P9. Uh, I look at this in and in try to look at this in a, in a simple way. Um, the P95 is, is the most certain case, not the most likely. It's the most, cert the most the case that you can say this is most certain to happen. Uh, the P5 is the, is the least likely. You know, it, it's the extre other extreme of the, of the distribution curve. And the P50 is the most likely. Now, it's only the most likely in a normal distribution. Sorry to get statistical here. <laughs> um, uh, you know, you're all familiar with the bell curve. Yeah? This is the most likely point because it's, it's the most probable outcome. That's the P50 in a normal distribution. The two flank bits, here is the most certain, and here is the, is the least likely. Does that help? What are the most important differences between your model and Colin Campbell's? <laughs> I, I don't know what's in Colin Campbell's model. Uh, I, I, I think a number of things. Um, first of all, the latest IHS data set is one thing, but not a big difference. The biggest difference is probably in treatment of exploration success in the future. Treatment of OPEC, the separation of these things rather than in, in components in terms of political components which is to use non-OPEC and OPEC as two quite distinct political units. Um, the enhanced oil recovery story is probably different, which is going to affect things in the future. 
But I think the main difference is the way we've separated OPEC from non-OPEC. You know, we, we don't think OPEC, we don't take such a pessimistic view of OPEC's reserves as Colin Campbell. That's probably the biggest difference. And that's based on you know, our own work in the Middle East for you know, 25 years. What about Mexico's decline rate and its impact on the U.S.? Hmm. <laughs> Mexico, yeah. Um, yeah, Cantorell, yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I, Mexico is, uh, you know, the, the decline in Cantorell, precipitous decline in Cantorell, which is not going to be arrested anytime soon, and the slow pace of Mexican replacement investment is going to have a, an impact on the U.S. in two ways. First of all, Mexico is a supplier of crude oil, and secondly, on, you know, the social fabric of Mexico. You know, the, 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 Mexi the Pemex has been run as a social welfare industry. If you talk to Pemex people, they say, we haven't made a profit, we've made a loss this year. You know, How is that possible at you know, $150 a barrel? Because the government takes it all in tax uh, and, and gives it to you know, in social welfare programs. So if that money ceases to go to social welfare prog programs in Mexico, there are going to be some disadvantaged Mexicans, a lot of them. That's going to have an impact on the U.S. Uh, we face a harsh reality from south of the border. So do they, though. They will um, uh, suffer the consequences most directly. How confident are you that you know the decline rate for non-OPEC production? Could it be faster than you have assumed? These, these are all supportive, easy, light powder. Yeah. Right down the middle of the plate, no soft pitches. No problem, yeah. <laughs> I haven't had a tough one yet. Um, good. Uh, the decline rate for non-OPEC is built up from all these fields. So, uh, you know, we think we've, we've because we've history matched using our, our, our statistical probability tables for all these fields, we think we've got a pretty good idea of the distribution of field sizes, the distribution of uh, dates between discovery and production, and the distribution of profiles. And the decline rate is pretty fast, uh, incidentally. Uh, if you take out the extra expir expiration, it's about 8%. So it's very, very fast because most of the fields are offshore. Uh, we think we're quite happy with our offshore decline rate and our non-OPEC decline rate. A political type question. How do you arrive at your political limits for OPEC production levels? Mm. <laughs> uh, combination of, of, I mean, Apart from being, uh, doing oil work and being, um, uh, working in the oil industry, I, I, we've also done a lot of geopolitical analysis on Middle East countries. And I've lived in the Middle East uh, most of my life. We just get a feel for what the decision-making process is like to come up with. You know, I spent 10, 12 years working on, it, on and in Iran. And you get a feel for how they make decisions, what sort of decisions they make when they do make them, and how they get implemented. And these are the results of our experience in the relatively slow pace of decision making, relatively slow pace of implementation, often incomplete implementation. So we don't think OPEC is going to be able to ramp up production capacity at a very, very fast rate. We think if they get another 10 million barrels a day in the next 20 years, that's quite good for OPEC. If they go any faster, I'll be quite surprised. Uh, we probably have enough questions to go for another hour, so I don't think I need to field a lot more if we can bring up the last couple. Uh, you showed that the world has consumed about 864, I see that's not 865 or 863, so 864 billion barrels to date. I thought it was around 1.1 billion. That's a pretty significant difference. Can you comment? Yeah, 864 are crude oil, crude oil only. Um, if you take all oil, yes, you get a higher number because you have NGLs, you have all the other things that have gone into, into world liquids. Um, but on crude oil, um, that's the number. That's our number anyway. Here's a tough one. Uh, Colin Campbell claims that the IHS database has declined in quality and reliability in the last decade, especially since it was bought by Sarah. 
Would you care to comment? I, I should add that came from friends of Sarah right there. Okay. All right. Um, I, I think I, yeah, IHS bought Petra Consultants, uh, and then they bought Sarah. But anyway, um, we haven't been uh, exclusive on using IHS. Uh, there are several countries where we we had our own information, and we also made sure we checked everything that we felt was, we felt comfortable with. For example, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait. Iran, Iraq, most of the OPEC countries, we didn't use SARA or IHS numbers exclusively because we didn't agree with them. I, most of our numbers were smaller than SARA's numbers. For non-OPEC countries, there were some, with USA, we didn't use SARA at all. We used our own database, which we got from the um, International Oil Scouts. You know, they provide historical production data for all, every single reservoir in the US, uh, every single pool. So you have to add them all up in some way to get to the original fields and make some kind of adjustment for what you expect in the future. But we thought this was a much better database than IHS had. And our history match for the US is almost perfect using that database where it wasn't with the IHS data. Uh, so we haven't been, we've, we've been careful with the IHS database. Whether it's more or less reliable than it used to be, um, it's difficult to say. I mean, that's a value judgment. It's the best data set in the world that's available. You know, we looked at Wood Mackenzie. Wood Mackenzie data is incomplete. They amalgamate fields. Um, it's just not suitable for the approach we adopted. Uh, we think the IHS database is as best as you're going to get, and we've modified it where we felt necessary. I have to tell you, Peter, that if Matt Simmons was up here, he would give you some thoughts about his uh, experience with, recent experience with the IHS database, but moving on. If North Gore is, is about to water out, how will this affect your analysis? Um, well, North Gore is producing um, quite a bit of water already. Uh, is it about to water out? Um, well, I don't think so. Uh, why don't I think so? Well, because of the way that um, Middle Eastern producers have produced their oil fields. You know, if they'd produced Gawa in the same way as they produced Prudhoe Bay, it would already be nearly dead. But they haven't. You know, they produced it at a much lower offtake rate. So the events in Gawa are unfolding quite slowly for an oil field. And Saudi Aramco can react with different remedial actions, recompletions, redrills, and so on and so forth to try and balance off its production. North Gawa is the place where, in my view, they will have to start EOR in the next couple of years in order to maintain some production from there because it will have effectively watered out. But we're talking about the very northern end of Gawa, not the whole of Gawa. Um, the north southern bit of Gawa has got different problems. <laughs> but the, whole, the northern part of Gawa, uh, a lot of it's been closed in already in recognition of the high water cut. Uh, how do you estimate yet to be discovered oil? Uh, and um, a follow-up is, what is the status of Caspian, specifically Kashagan production? I, I take the second question first, Kashagan. Um, I, I think Kashagan, Kashagan production, Kashagan is a field, a very, very nice big field, but the problems are technical. Um, and environmental. You know, it's a field with enormous quantities of H2S, very high pressure. Uh, the development plan has, water, has gas injection, sour gas injection, uh, not been done on this scale before. Um, taking very high pressure gas, processing it, repressurizing it, putting it back into the ground is expensive, uh, is technically challenging, especially when the environment is very sensitive. This is a sturgeon breeding area, the water depth goes from zero to two meters, depending on the time of year. Uh, it's a very difficult area to operate. Kashagan is going to produce some oil, it's going to produce a lot of oil, but it's not imminent. Um, I think they've always been rather optimistic about when the production would start. Uh, we've always thought you know, 2013, 2015, first production is more likely. Uh, maybe it won't even make 2015. 
somewhere around there they'll start producing something at this sort of uh, price range. But it's a technical challenging project, so the ramp up will be slow. It won't go up to one and a half million barrels a day very quickly. And there'll be a pilot period when have, people have to get used to running the equipment, seeing how it functions. You know, disposal of sulfur will be an issue when they start um, producing gas as well. So, yeah, sometime in the future, but it will happen. And the first question was, how do you estimate yet to be discovered oil? It's an opinion. That's all I can say. It's an opinion. And we have a different opinion to USGS, and some people might have a different opinion. But, you know, we, we've looked at all the basins that we're familiar with and said, well, some of these are going to work and some are not, and this is how we think it's going to work. And we come up with a number which is not that different to most of the industry participants. You know, when I talk to Total or to ExxonMobil or to Shell, um, we roughly agree on future production, future exploration success, and peak oil. There isn't a lot of difference, actually. The difference is in you know, other things like how much tar sands will be and so on. But on crude oil, most oil field practitioners don't support the USGS view, and they're not that, you know, not overly pessimistic either. You know, something around 300 billion barrels yet to be discovered, another Saudi Arabia over 40 years. Yeah, it seems plausible. It's an opinion. Uh, why do you think that uh, Saudi Arabia is politically stable? This comes from Jeremy Gilbert, <laughs> who spent a little time there. Yeah, I spent some time too. Is it politically stable? Um, uh, it's, it's a, it's, you know, the, 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 the number of commentators that said Saudi Arabia is about to disintegrate over the last 20 years uh, it hasn't happened yet. And there are a number of reasons why it hasn't happened to do with the way Saudi Arabian society works. Uh, you know, there are these internal, internal debates and conflicts within Saudi society, but ultimately they all come down to, well, we like the system as it is. And, you know, on the one hand, you have, well, we're going to have al-Qaeda take over. On the other hand, well, you know, the Democrats from the Hejaz would like to take over. Um, you know, there's this Wahhabi House of Saud relationship. But... You know, as a, a British ambassador I spoke to about this I think about 10 years ago, who'd been spent some time in Saudi Arabia, said, well, you know, we've been talking about this internally for years, but it hasn't happened yet. So I think that Saudi Arabia isn't politically unstable um, in, in the sense that it will disintegrate utterly and completely. Uh, is it politically stable? Uh, probably, by comparison with a lot of states in the region, yeah. I have to admit, uh, Randy Udall and I had a uh, uh, day-long uh, conference on peak oil in 1998 in Denver, and we were skeptical of the, of the very same response. And 10 years later, indeed, uh, there they are still pumping away, and, and yet the population is growing uh, dramatically, internal consumption is growing, and, and uh, there, there could be a different story there, who knows. Um, a, a question came up in several of these uh, has to do with the net exports story. Um, it's one thing to see production increase. It's another thing to see the domestic demand be increasing uh, to an extent that it may offset the, uh, uh, the gains. Could you address that issue uh, of world exports going forward? Yeah, obviously we looked here at a balance between demand and supply on a global level, so that the export issue is, is a tactical one, but it's not a strategic one. You know, demand is also coming from Middle East countries, so that will be taken into account in looking at spare capacities. Um, most of the Middle Eastern countries' population growth has, has been very high, 4%, 5% per annum in some. Most of their uh, consumption per capita has gone up too, so it's not just a population increase, it's also an increase in, in consumption per capita, particularly in countries like Iran, uh, Saudi Arabia, which are major exporters. So their export buffer, if you like, their export volume is, is potentially uh, liable to shrink. And there are all kinds of forecasts about Iran that in 10 years' time they'll be importing oil. Um, it's possible, but I think we forget that you know, Iranians also play policy and chess and make decisions. 
So they will not allow this to happen in some way. I mean, they're utilizing gas enormously internally, so much so their gas per capita is now shooting through the roof. And that will also, no doubt, be taken care of in the future as well. Slowly, but will be taken care of. They will always try and preserve their revenue earnings, in other words, as much as possible. And when I looked at Iran over a 15-year period, their export margin had stayed pretty much the same, which means they've tried to manage it. And I suspect most of these countries will try to do that too. But you know, from a point of view of demand, supply, balance, it doesn't matter where the demand's coming from. What matters is the balance. And the balance is the spare capacity. And whether it's exported or not is in some ways not that important. Of course, if you're an importer, uh, exports matter, but um, not from a demand from a world point of view. Um, we've given you a pretty good grilling here from the audience. Um, one more question here. A uh, number of people have asked, have, have you studied the change in net energy of the oil produced over time? In other words, the tar sands from Canada will be uh, require much more inputs for the same barrel of output. Yeah, we did look at this from the, for the tar sands specifically, um, and also for you know for biofuels and oil shale and all these rather sort of marginal uh, marginal things. For crude oil, uh, there isn't going to be much change in net energy consumed per barrel for quite some time out, um, really until EOR starts to become a big big component, because most of the production we're going to see over the next ten years is going to be conventional crude oil that we've we've seen for a while. Uh, so the net energy consumed per barrel of oil produced isn't going to change very much. In the tar sands, which let's not forget are marginal here, I mean even tar sands go to 4 million barrels a day, that's you know, 4 million barrels on top of 90. So it's as a totality, tar sands will not make much difference. Of course tar sands themselves, if you're buying tar sands crude, you're buying stuff with a lot of energy in it. A lot of energy has been consumed to produce it. And one of the things that we have looked at, which we think is quite a, an important way of trying to balance off some of these issues of global warming and, and peak oil, is the role of nuclear energy in, in process technology. You know, nuclear energy heat can be used in making things like tar sands and oil shale cleaner. Otherwise, they're very dirty fuels to use. But if you can use nuclear energy in, say, a gas to liquids plant or a coal to liquids plant, then a lot of the energy input, which is heat, is coming out of nuclear power, electricity, rather than out of burning coal or burning fuel. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, ju a couple of, of uh, quick remarks before you all head for the, the networking session, which, by the way, is out by the pool. It's a little easier to, uh, I think you'll, you'll enjoy your drinks out there. Uh, we do have, uh, we start at 8 a.m. tomorrow. Um, I, I want to, uh, one reflection here. Uh, it, Peter and I were having a, a, a brief chat prior to his presentation, and we, we talked about the fact that he would be viewed as a modest optimist by this group. And, and, and we both sat and said, so if long term, if, if we're thinking of Toyota, for example, and to the vehicles that Toyota is manufacturing today, they will be, some of them will still be on the road in, uh, uh, after the peak or the, 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 the uh, 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 flattening there that showed in about 2016, 2018. Um, it's really the, the infrastructure and the long-term story that we need to send as a message to folks. And the exact pinning the tail on the timing donkey is much less important. So that's what I certainly uh, hope you will uh, appreciate from uh, Peter's remarks. Again, thank you for being here this evening, and we'll see you tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. <laughs>